God bless you. We bring you greetings in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to get swiftly into the word for today. We're going to call upon our reader to read for us. Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 23, starting at verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. Now watch this. This is, this is what God called fornicators, by the way. He calls them whores. That's what he calls a fornicator. This is what God calls a fornicator. Now, a lot of times we have our definition of fornication, but I'm just going to give you God's definition. And the thing of it is, um, a lot of times we would use this word with somebody who's with more than one partner or something like that. But this, in general, if someone is, is having sex outside of marriage uh, and they're not married people, they become a whore. That's what God is calling them. That's bad. That's a, that's a pretty rough name, isn't it? Nobody should want to want to have that name. But that's what God will call them. There will be no what? Read again. There shall be no whore of daughters of Israel. Nor not, I don't want any of my daughters partaking in sex before marriage. I don't want that, God is saying. I don't want that. That's not what I want for my kids. I want my kids to keep it righteous. I want them to keep it holy. That's what I want for my kids. As he said in the book of Peter, holy, uh, be ye holy for I am holy. If we reverse that, he would be saying, holy am I, holy ye be. Amen. So I want you to be holy. Be ye holy as the Lord our God is holy. So then God is telling you how he wants you to live, how, you want, how he wants to be glorified through your life. Amen. One is, if you don't have, if you're not married, you shouldn't be having sex at all. Don't hold hands. Don't kiss. That gets you in trouble, by the way. Because you start stirring up the flesh. The hand is going to mean more than that later. Because you're going to start feeling something. That you don't need to be feeling before marriage. Okay? So, God wanna, he want to help you out with that. Amen. She said, hold my hand. I just want you walking across the street. Said, you can walk across the street without me holding your hand. <laughs> just hold my hand. No, I ain't holding your hand. Because that'll get us in trouble. You know, one thing that shakes in my hand, you, you won't let it go. That's something going on. <laughs> There's something about to take place. <laughs> you start to warm up, the, you know, warm yourself up to something you, you don't need to be doing, right? But we're just trying to avoid. Now, you can care about that person, love that person, plan even to marry that person, but guard yourself before the time. Don't have your honeymoon before your marriage. Okay, don't have that. Go ahead, finish reading. Nor a sodomite of sons of Israel. I don't want no homosexual sons. Call them sodomites back then. Because of the reputation of Sodom and Gomorrah, is t that's the name tagged to one that commits homosexuality. They're called a sodomite. God said, I don't want my, I don't want my sons to be sodomites. I don't want my sons to be homosexuals. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at today, uh, coming back to a message we started on last week, amen, and the tapes didn't go that well for us, so you're going to get a chance to hear the second part of, of, of the first message of last week, which is called Three Horses. Three Horses. Three Horses. We're going to name them. One is adultery. One is fornication, and one is homosexuality. These are the horses that most people ride on. These are the horses. These are three horses. Come this election, one horse may lead the way. It may be homosexuality because of, of the promotion of it. 
okay, of the promotion of it. Now, we are people of God that believe that God can change you no matter what state you're in. So we're not here to condemn people for sin, but we're here to help them come out of their sins. You understand what I'm saying? We're not here to condemn homosexuals, fornicators, or adulterers, but we are certainly here to help them come out of that lifestyle and to live a life that's pleasing to God. And we're not going to uh, compromise although we love you. We love you enough to tell you that these three horses will lead you to the lake of fire. That you'll end up in eternal damnation because of these horses. The devil want to take you for a ride, but you don't have to go. And God has provided a way of escape. So that even though you've done these acts, you can be forgiven for all of these things and have a place in the kingdom of God. You can have all of that. It's so beautiful. You can live a life in these three areas and God will save you like you never committed one act against him. He can forgive you quicker than you can blink your eyes. And hounding you from that day forward as though you never, ever disobeyed him. That's how beautiful this is. So we want to offer this to you that's on one of these horses. That God wants to change you. He wants you to go through a transformation. He's not condemning you. But if you, if you stay in this state, you will be condemning yourself. Because if you die in this state. For sure, hell will be a portion. It will be a portion. And you can sing on the choir. You can be on the usher board. You can be in, even in a pulpit. If you die like this, hell will be a portion. Okay? He that's filthy, as Revelation said, will be filthy still. That's talking about if you die in the state of sin, you're going to be filthy in the sight of God. And there's no place for you but hell. Because you reject the transformation that God could have given you in this life. So that you could receive eternal life. So no one's condemning you. But we're on a rescue mission to save you. It's what we're on. And with love and compassion we reach out to you. Not to condemn you for your sin. But to help you to escape your sins. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, who died and hung on the cross for every sin that you ever committed. But it's not just that he died for your sins, but he died also to bring you out of your sins. Amen. So you come when you come to church, you come as you are. But through the blood of Jesus, we, we know that you won't stay as you are. He, he wants to change you. Amen. He wants to change you. But there be no change, then there be no interest into heaven for you. That's what Jesus meant when he said, except you be born again, except there be a change of state, you cannot enter into God's kingdom. You have to change. You have to be born again. You have to go through a metamorphosis, a transformation in order to attain salvation. Let nobody fool you. You can't stay in the state that you're in if it's a state of sin and expect for God to receive you because he won't. Because he's offering you a change that he can give you through your submission to Christ. Let's keep reading. Yes. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 32. No, read, read that verse again of, of Deuteronomy. Yes. Deuteronomy 23 and... and um, 17. 17. Yes. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. Yes. Nor a sodomite of sons of Israel. So I don't want fornicators. I don't want homosexuals in my kingdom, God is saying. But I will change the, the fornicator and I will change the homosexual. 
if they wants to be changed. So they can have entrance. I'll take them out of darkness and bring them into the marvelous light. That's what Jesus is saying to you. Jesus can change you. Even if you feel like you can't be changed, he can change you. You may lie to yourself and say you was born that way. But we'll work with you on that too. Because everybody was born a sinner. So you, you're practically right. You was born a sinner. There's no question about it. But you don't have to die a sinner. We got you. You say you was born that way, but you don't have to die that way. We, we're going we're gonna to take what you just said and help you with that. You said you was born that way. Okay, all right, you were born that way. But Jesus is offering you a chance not to die that way. Is that fair enough? Amen. Cool. Yes. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. Yes. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman, lack of understanding. Now, we're looking at all the horses now. We just talked about fornicators. We talked about all... You know, we're being nice when we say fornicators. This is called your whores. Bob say whore. So we, we <laughs> so praise God. We're being nice about this calling you fornicators, but, but God calls you a whore. So you fornicators, you sodomites, or you homosexuals. We looked at two horses. Now we're getting to the third horse, and it's adultery. Many churchgoers will fall prey to this. And all right now as I speak. There are many churchgoers that are riding this horse called adultery. Many. And they'll fight you tooth and nail and tell you, no, 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 I got Bible to prove it is okay for me to do this. It's sad enough that you're doing it. It's even more sadder that you twist God's word so you can justify the desires of your flesh. Your flesh is that strongly pouring you. It's pouring on you so strong that you can't even hear the truth of the word of God. That you will pervert God's word to continue in your adultery. And you don't even realize it, probably. That your flesh has more influence over you than the spirit of God and his word. That you would twist God's word up. Just to justify your act of adultery. And we're going to look at some things people use to twist in order to continue. They're trying to get God on their side, but he's not on your side in this case. You're on, the wrong, you're on a horse that you shouldn't be on. And if you die in that state, hell will be your portion. It will be your portion. And you're going to hear preachers that are going to tell you the truth about it. And you're not going to want to hear them. And you're going to find preachers that's going to tell you exactly what you want to hear so you can continue in it. And those are the ones you're going to listen to. Because your flesh is just that strong. Your flesh has more power over you than the word of God at that point. So this is why we had to come here. Read that verse again. But whosoever committeth adultery with a woman, lack of understanding. Guess what? See, when you go to explain to them that they're wrong, they're going to fight you on that because they don't have understanding. Of course, because you're in the picture, you can't see the picture. When you're in sin, you, 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 you don't have any discernment of God's word. You can't discern God's word because this word is spiritually discerned. When you're operating after the lust of your flesh, you cannot discern God's word. That's why I say the one that commit adultery lacketh understanding. But that won't stop them from trying to use the Bible to justify it. Though. That won't stop them. How are you going to be in adultery and explain the Bible to me? Really? How are you going to do that? Once you're in sin, you have no understanding of what God is saying. You have to come out of sin to hear what God is saying. You cannot be in sin. And you can tell that you're all messed up and you're tore up from the floor up when you begin to try to take the scripture and twist it so that you can continue in that act of adultery. But God is trying to bring you out. and He's warning you because he loves you. 
He knows that he cannot accept you if you die in that state. So the idea is to rescue you in this life at this time to get you to a point where you can make the transition and go through the metamorphosis and the change. Now, all of these sins that we just talked about, these horses, it begins with your thinking. The root of all sin begins with one's thoughts and one's logic. The way you begin to view life. You begin to justify it. You begin to say it's okay. You begin to convince yourself that it's all right to be in this state. And everybody that's telling you it's wrong, they're the problem, not you. That's normally how it turns out. Everybody that points out to you that it's wrong, now all of a sudden, the whole world has a problem with the Bible because the Bible is telling them that they're wrong. So now they'll tell you, you know, you can't, uh, you run into people that say, I'm, I, I, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. They're just basically saying they don't believe the Bible. Let's just be clear on what we're talking about. That's why I talk to people on the street and they tell me, I'm not religious, I'm just spiritual. I say, let's be clear about what we're talking about. You mean you don't believe the Bible? That's what you mean. So all of a sudden, you're right and God's wrong. We've come to this point in time in history where man is right but God is wrong. Really. We must be in the last days. This place is about to be told. Something's about to happen. Because of the attitudes and dispositions of people at this point in time. That now they have, they don't want to believe the truth, so now they say they have their own truth. When did we come to this place? You run to people and say, well, that's your truth, and I have my truth, you have truth. It's no, your truth, my truth. Is this the truth, sir? Is what God said in his word. Is this it? It's not about your own personal truth, your own understanding of life. It's about what's already written. So then now you don't, you, you don't want to believe the Bible because the Bible is going to tell you to come out of that lifestyle that you're living. And you don't want that. You want to stay on that horse. Where well, that horse is about to lead you to the lake of fire. I'm throwing out the lifeline. If you can't grab it, then nothing I can do about that. It's your choice. It's your call. It's your rodeo. you behind the stern wheel of your life. If you want to run it into the ground, nobody can stop you. If you want to call a lie the truth, then you can do that. If you want to call darkness light, you can do that. But you're going to end up in the lake of fire in the end. You're going to be eternally punished for that in the end. You're going to go to a place called hell. That some have decided they don't want to believe in that. Belief is a choice. You can choose to believe the truth or believe a lie. It's up to you. But you will pay for your choice if it's the wrong one, though. There will be consequences for that. Because you chose to believe a lie instead of the truth. Because the lie helps you to live out the life you want to live, which is against God and even against yourself. Keep reading. Have you finished that verse yet? Mm -mm. Let's roll over to the next. I didn't finish it. And he that doeth it, and he that doeth it destroys his own soul. Now watch this. If you're committing adultery, God is saying you destroy your own soul. You're hurting yourself more than you realize. You're alienating yourself from God. But you say, I still sing on the choir. I still on the usher board. I'm still doing whatever. I'm talking to church people now. You may be doing a lot of things. But God is not pleased with you. If you're in that state. Now the problem is. Because of a lack of understanding. From those that commit adultery. We're going to have to. Tolerate their, their ignorance. Of the word. They're not going to see things as obvious. In God's word. Though we point it out to them. Because it's amazing. That they can. Go to church and live this kind of life and think that God is pleased with that. It's amazing. They have to twist the scripture to do that. You know, the, with the word wicked, the, the word wicked, what it derives from, it comes from, it means to twist and to turn. 
anyone that takes God's word and twists it so they can live in sin is what you call wicked. When you twist the truth so you can live in error, we call that wicked. It means the twist and the turn. So if, you, if somebody takes the word of God and try to make it something that's not, so they can live in sin, they become wicked. They become wicked. Not just, not ignorant, but wicked. Because they're taking the word of God and they're using it in a way that it can promote sin instead of righteousness. Let's go on. Yes. First Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 13. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication. Now but watch this. The body is not for fornication. What is it for? But for the Lord and yes. the Lord for the body. Yes. So now, again, is 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 moving us away from fornication, right? Uh, all of this, again, going to the three horses, the devil will end up placing people or people end up placing themselves on these three horses that the devil will present to them. Everybody falls into one of these categories if they have not given their life to Christ. They'll fall into these categories. Let's go on, yes. Verse 18. Flee fornication. Flee fornication. In other words, we're not going to play with this thing. You got to understand your makeup. You're not built to play with fire, you're going to get burnt. You're not built for that. Let's not stick around and see what happens next. Let's just get out of town. <laughs> you up there with somebody, and y'all, you know, and you start looking crazy in the face. They start looking crazy in the face. Next thing you know, something's going to happen. Uh, y'all looking at each other, cock at it. Something about to go down. <laughs> it's time to get out of there. Flee fornication. Understand your limitation. You was not built to be tested in that way. You're going to fall. Don't let nobody press the buttons because you're going to fail. See, you, you just let them press buttons. They press another button. They say, no, there you go. And now you're asking God to forgive you. You don't need that. Amen? Let's go on. Finish the verse? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now watch this. This really falls into all sexual immorality, such as fornication, adultery, uh, homosexuality. All of this falls into these categories because when you sin in this manner, it's showing you the magnitude of what you're doing. Read that again, that verse again, so we understand what's really taking place. Yes. Read that again, which you just read. So you need to understand the magnitude of what you're doing here. Yes. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Go back to what it said in, in, in Proverbs. It said you sin against your own body there as well. So when you look at it, eat, or homosexuality, most definitely you're sinning against your own body. You're violating yourself. You're violating yourself. So God is showing you that you don't know how severe this thing is. And then also, when you get into these categories, it, it, it puts you in a place of alienation. It's very hard to reach God in this mode. You got to come out of it to reach him. It's not easy to reach God while you're in this kind of state of mind. You got to bring that state of mind to an end. And understand that when these moments come, it first originate with a thought. If you could kill that thought, then because that thought will give birth to the action. If you could get rid of the thought, there would be no action. But if you're entertaining it and just enjoying the pleasure of that thought, the next thing you know, there you go. But you have to remember when it's a thought, 
you, you need to kill it at that point. That's why the Bible tells us to cast down evil imaginations and everything that exhorts itself against the knowledge of God. To bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. To bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. To bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because what happens is if you don't bring that thought into uh, obedience to Christ, if you that thought, if you don't bring it into captivity, then it's going to bring you into captivity. That's how it works. Every notion brings emotion. And it could never have been emotion if there wasn't a notion. If there wasn't for a thought, you would never ended up in the situation you was in. But if you can take care of that level, where it's just a thought, and repent before God when that thought comes. Say, Father, remove this from me. Let it be far from me. And begin to tell yourself, in the name of Jesus Christ, this would never take place in my life. It would never be fulfilled in my life. I'm going to fulfill the righteousness of Christ. I'm going to fulfill, amen, uh, God's holiness in this earth. I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to, praise God, practice such things. I cast that thought down in the name of Jesus Christ. It has no part with me. Begin to fight it at that level. And you successfully live above fornication and adultery very easily. Very easily. But the thought comes. And you have to fight those thoughts. Amen? Yes, go ahead. Matthew chapter 5 verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife... Saving for the cause of for fornication. Now, because when you when you read this, people would take this again. This is where people that like that because they don't they're in adultery. They 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 don't have understanding. They tell you, well, uh, you can put this person away for the cause of fornication. It can be also interpreted as sexual immorality. But here's the thing: God is going to speak in the book of Matthew to two audiences. You're going to speak to those that are married and those that's about to get married. The Jewish custom in the engagement, as we use the word engagement, they use the word patrol. In the patrol, you had the same rights as in marriage to put the person away if they was unfaithful. If they violated in the engagement, you could put them to death. An example of that, save for the cause of fornication, is what Joseph was about to do to Mary. Save for the cause of fornication. He was about to put her away. And the Bible said he thought to put her away privately. He's not married to her at this point. But yet he can put her away. Because under Jewish customs, you had the same rights in the engagement to put somebody away. Now, when we look at the word put away, it's a little different from you guys going to court and just getting a little paper and signing off and saying, I'm divorcing this person. It's a little different than that. When they say put you away, they're going to put you away. Mary's about to get her brains bust out if Joseph don't speak up. If Joseph don't get involved, Mary's going to be stoned to death. She certainly was going to be put away. He sought to do it privately, meaning don't make it public, because if we make it public, she's not going to live. Not in Israel. Remember, God said there shall be no whores. Amongst the daughters, daughters of Israel, we read that in Deuteronomy, 23rd chapter. And so the Jews wasn't going to have it. If in the engagement, you was found unfaithful, and the way they would find that out is that when they do marry you, and found out that you messed around before marriage came, meaning you're not a virgin, you're going to be put away for the cause of fornication, saved for the cause of fornication. In other words, you're going to be put to death because you fornicated before you got married. And so, therefore, if they go in there, and the way they did it back then, traditionally, they go into the, the engagement. They had the engagement. The marriage takes place. They go into the, the bed chamber with you. That's a part of the marriage ceremony. You have, you have your, your, your intimacy. You come out. You come out with a sheet with blood on it. That shows she's a virgin. She was a virgin. She didn't fornicate. That's what they did traditionally. 
Otherwise, he come out and there's no blood in the sheet. He could demand her death. Saying that, you know, she was un unfaithful. I can put her away for the cause of fornication. When did she fornicate? Before we got married. She broke the patrol. She broke the engagement. That's why Joseph could put Mary away. He hadn't married her yet. Because her belly rose up. She's pregnant now. And Joseph got a choice here. He can claim that as his child, or he can say that wasn't me and she's done. He must have claimed that was his child. Because people can do the math. You get somebody pregnant, you may rush to get married. They're going to count the months and weeks. <laughs> they ain't going to tell you that. They're going to count on you. Once they count, they say, uh-huh, yeah, they, 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 got, they got busy before they got married. Yeah, 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 they ain't as holy as they think they are. Or they going to talk about it. He say nothing to you about it, though. Oh, people do that all the time. I have people come back and tell me, say, you know what? That child, such and such, you know they must have. <laughs> I say, why don't you leave that alone? They're married now. Leave that alone. It's none of your business. Don't meddle. Thank God they got married. If that was the case... They went on and got married to make it to make it right. So we thank God for that. Amen. And we're gonna keep it moving. But people will count. They count back. Say, oh yeah, 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 yeah. They start just gigging to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you think? I don't have to think about it. Just count how the when the child come. And that be the talk amongst those in the assembly. But the point of it is. He wasn't married to her, but he was going to put her away. So you can see when it talks about putting away, you don't have to be married to be put away under Jewish custom. That's why Matthew wrote the way he wrote. So when you read the scripture that says, save for the cause of fornication, we talk about two groups of people, those that's engaged to be married, right? There's a separate group you're going to mention later, those that's already married. You got a word for them too. But for those that haven't got married, here's a word for you. You can be put away for the cause of fornication, if you mess up in the engagement, we got a word for you. Save for the cause of fornication. We're going to put you away. So that's the Jewish now. We're talking to Matthew wrote to the Jews. You got to know who he wrote to to know what he was talking about. Amen. The five W's we always talk about in the scriptures, you got to know. One of the W's is who. Who was it? He wasn't talking to the Gentiles. Gentiles, we, you know how we do it. We've already been who, who, who knows how many people before we, time, time, time we get married. So it's not even an issue for us. But for the Jewish family, it's an issue. Because what they've been taught in the law, there shall not be not one whore, one fornicator, one whore amongst the daughters of Israel. God commanded this. They would have to keep themselves. They had to stay virgins. Now, we Gentiles, we know we didn't keep that. But in Israel, you have to be a virgin before you get married. That's the way it worked. So that's why he had to give the word the way he did to the Jewish family. You can put them away in the engagement. And then we're going to re keep reading. Keep reading. You can read that whole verse so we can get a clarification. Yes. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now we're going to get to the other states that is divorced. First we're looking at put away. Now we're talking about divorce. Only married people can get what? Divorce. divorce. But under Jewish custom, both engaged and married people could be put away. But only married people can be divorced. So you see, he's talking to two groups. If you marry someone that's been divorced, what he says, read that again. It says, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Now, a clarification on that is to say that if you marry a woman that's been in a covenant with her first husband, meaning they both only been married to each other, no one prior have they been married to, they only been married to each other, right? This is where you look at 
the specifics of if you marry a person that leave their first spouse and get married to somebody else, while their first spouse live, they become an adulterer. Very plain and simple. But guess what? This is going to ride over a lot of people's heads that's in adultery. Or those that's thinking about committing adultery. Let's put it that way. <laughs> got some of them just, they got the thought in their head. They're already adulterer in their mind. Because they're going to do this thing. They said, but the Bible said they're about to make a bad move. But the Bible said, save for the cause of fornication. On, on that note, many have gone astray because they lack understanding. Because they're an adulterer in their heart. And because they're an adulterer in their heart, the Bible says that they have no understanding. That's what Proverbs said. You're already one in your heart. It starts in the heart first before the act comes. So you can be an adulterer or a fornicator. Or even a homosexual without even the act. Just in your head. When people say it's okay to commit homosexuality, they are already a homosexual unawares. You know why? Because it's in their heart. And the first step to becoming a fornicator, an adulterer, or a homosexual is acceptance. Once you accept it, once you say it's okay when it's wrong, you're already there. You're already there. You're actually that person. You are a homosexual. You are an adulterer because you have said it's okay. It's okay. That means acceptance when it's not okay. When it's not okay. Yes, let's go on. We're about to come to a close. Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the, the law, and how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Now we're looking at the, the original covenant between you and the person you married. Now you may have married Jack the Ripper and didn't know he was Jack the Ripper but that's your problem now because that's the first man in your life as marriage and you're the first woman in his life as, as in marriage and now y'all are in a covenant and if you try to marry somebody else you become a covenant breaker. Okay? We saw you marry Jack the Ripper. Everybody was trying to get you, stop you from marrying him. If you can remember back, probably it was people that told you that you don't want to marry that man, but you married him anyway. It was, you, it was like y'all against the world, so to speak. It was folk that told you he was no good, but you couldn't. <laughs> now you come back and say, see, that couldn't have been God's will. No, it wasn't, but it was your will. So once you did it, it's over. You're in the covenant now. God had better for you, but once you make the decision, then he's yours. She's yours. And to death do your part. And Jesus explained in the 19th chapter of Matthew when they said, but Moses gave them a, a writing of divorce because they was marrying, uh, they was changing wives like you change shoes back in the days of Israel. And they, got, they could just leave a person, pick up another, but they were just a bunch of adulterers. When Jesus came and told them the truth, even the apostles spoke up and said, Lord, if the case be so, it's not good to marry them. Because <laughs> you're about to take this lollipop out of our mouth. And we've been enjoying this. This freedom of this marrying whosoever we will. Trying a woman on like a pair of shoes. Don't fit, get another pair. She ain't worked out, give me another pair of shoes. I'm in line again. Huh? I'm available. I'm on the market. Let me get me another woman now. Or a woman says, get another man. You know how folks say on the street, I'm back on the market. <laughs> well, you can't do that and please God at the same time. Because God wants you to do everything that's correct and right. And it may not go with your logic, your reasoning, and you may even misinterpret scriptures because of your logic and reasoning. But guess what? Lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Go with what he say. Don't go with what you think, what you feel. Go with what God has said in his word. 
You don't even know the difference between God's word and your flesh talking to you. Your flesh is talking. It's yearning. It's burning. You're on fire. Huh? And that's not Holy Ghost fire, by the way. <laughs> uh, you're on fire. I heard people take scriptures out of context such as it's better to marry to burn than to burn. Guess what? God ain't talking about getting married when you start burning in your flesh. That's a misinterpretation of scripture. Because if you marry someone on the basis of lust, you may end up breaking up because it's not love. Your glue to your marriage is love. It's love. Lust cannot consistently hold people together. Because lust is like a tide. It goes up and it goes down. It's not consistent. Love is. The reason why people separate because of their lack of love. Agape is missing. Agape. God kind of love. Now the problem is is that it has to be in both of your hearts. You got to have that God kind of love to stay together. One can have the God kind of love. The other one don't have the God kind of love. You probably may fall to the wayside. You both need to have that God kind of love where you're going to be in it for the long run. And you won't be loving and you won't be loving because of. You'll be loving in spite of. Unconditional love. We don't have to fit your fancy in order to make it with you. Praise God. You can love them with the love of God unconditionally. The God kind of love. Mixed marriages work and make marriages stay together. But if one like it and the other one have it, it ain't going to work out usually. It's going to be, you know, kind of messed up. But if you get to that place where you have to leave your spouse, and that is the one that you have a covenant with, meaning that that's on, y'all both got married with just only y'all two. You went and never married, married prior to that. You only be married to that person. That person only be married to you. You're in a covenant. And you come to a place where you can't be with that person, then the Bible tells you to remain single or be reconciled. In other words, stay by yourself or come back together. If you can handle being by yourself, then do that. But if you can't, come back together. Please don't go out there and get married a second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, and say call for the cause of fornication. Please don't do that. Because that's what a lot of Christians are doing. You know, the Bible says, save for the cause of fornication. Because your flesh is talking now. That's not the Bible talking to you. That's your flesh talking. You took the word of God out of context. And you're going to get married anyway, whether you find a scripture or not for it. You're just throwing that on me so I can leave you alone about it. You know what I mean? That's what it's all about. Get me off your back. Or getting some brother or sister off your back that's trying to tell you the truth of the word of God. Yes, it's closed in Hebrews. Now, all this is said out of love because God wants to rescue you so that you don't allow these horses to lead you into destruction and damnation. Okay? And I promise you, God will not fail when it comes to his word. If he tells you, if you die in this state, in these states that we're referring to, you're not going to see him in peace. You're not going to see him in peace. If you want a chance... Being an adulterer and dying in adultery, I'm here to tell you, as a servant of God, you would not see him in peace if you die in this state. You're going to be filthy. As the Bible says, he that's filthy, let him be filthy still. Yes, it's closing this, yes. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. In the bed undefiled. See, marriage is what God instituted. That's why it's honorable. Everything else is not instituted, instituted by God. God didn't, wasn't a, the one that instituted it. Fornication is not something God ever established. Adultery is not something God ever established. This is the way of transgression. Homosexuality which is perverted sex, God never, ever established that. All of these are the horses that Satan established for you to ride on, to alienate you and separate you from God, to make sure that you die in your sins. God never established these things, but marriage he established. Marriage is honorable in all. 
God said, the man that finds a wife findeth a good thing and attaineth favor from the Lord. Because God instituted it. He instituted it. It's a legal relationship in the sight of God. Any other relationship is not legally founded in, in the eyes of God. You're a fornicator, you, 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 you're in an illegal relationship. Or we may just say, if you're a whore, you're in an illegal relationship. If you are a homosexual, you're in an illegal relationship, spiritually speaking. If you are an adulterer, you are in an illegal relationship. In the days of Noah, uh, uh, Jesus spoke about the days of Noah, as it were, in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. He said, they shall be married and given in marriage. He's talking about covenant breakers. People are going to be getting married two and three and four times again while their first spouse still liveth. And this is supposed to mark the end of the world for us. That's how the world is going to end in that state. And you got a boatload of people that's in adultery right now in churches with suit and ties, with dresses on, with dresses, long dresses, big hats on the head, look like they stepped off a stagecoach, <laughs> shouting holy, holy, holy. <laughs> but they are in violation. Now, we know the world, those that don't know Christ, many of them are in violation. That's something we know that is, you know, custom for the world. Adultery is custom for Hollywood style. Get married three and four times. Don't stay with nobody. Hollywood style. Or you may want to say American style. There's more people being divorced in America than any place in the world. So we can call it love American style. This is the way it is. And I remember talking to a guy from India, and I said to this guy from India, I said, uh, man, how can you guys let your parents plan your marriage? He said, but we don't divorce as much as you Americans. I got quiet, praise God. He may got something that was working. Because <laughs> actually, biblically speaking, that's what they did back in the Bible days. The parents planned who you married back in the day. You, you, you disagree or disagree to it, but they, you know. And they, but you still have the option to agree, though, or disagree. But still, they would strongly recommend this is the right person for you. And, and, and children would trust that because they already have a head start. They know about this life before you got in this life, so you kind of lean to your parents at that time. And that's what they're doing in India and in other parts of the world, too. That's what they're doing. But love American style is just, you know, hey, if it don't work, everybody goes in with reservations. They're already looking that if it don't work, this is what I'm going to do. They got a plan already in place. If it don't work out, then I should marry somebody else, you gone. I'm going to make sure you sign the agreement, you'll get nothing that belongs to me. Because they already planned it, it ain't going to work. <laughs> it's, a plan. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. They go in with reservations. So they're expecting for it not to work. Yes, it's going to close out, yes. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed is undefiled. But what's the next thing it says? But the whoremongers and adulterers. Again, he's calling fornicators whores. But when you put you all together, you become whoremongers. <laughs> so, but, but, but whoremongers and what? Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. He's telling you if you die in this state, heaven will not be your home. It's a harsh reality, and it's hard for a lot of preachers to tell you this, but I have to tell you. God can take you out of this state. That's why Jesus hung on the cross, so you could come out of this state and step into a holy state. A holy state. And you know, God allows things to go wrong in your life when you start getting in these areas. And there are signs that let us know, get out of it, but we still stay in it. Everything blow up in people's faces while they're in the act of adultery and they still hold on to it. Still saying, proclaiming it as God and it's God's will, but it's really your will. Fornicators, fighting to be fornicators, shacking up for years. Say, we're getting along fine. But God is showing them little signs here and there to let them know this is not my will. 
homosexuals tearing up their bodies, having problems, things happening to them, things going on in their body that they shouldn't be experiencing because of that very act. And they ignore that. God is letting them experience these things so they can't feel justified in this situation. But that, but that they may come out of it. See, the Lord loves you so much. He'll let you, let your body be destroyed in this life. Meaning he'll let you go down, suffer all kinds of diseases, sicknesses, all kinds of stuff will hit you. Because he's trying to save you. And in the midst of all that chaos, if you just look up to God and say, Lord, I want out. He will bring you out. That's how good God is. Though you tore yourself up, destroyed your life, gave yourself such a bad reputation before the people, God will still forgive you and restore the honor that you lost. That's how good Jesus is. All you got to do is ask him into your life. Let him take over. Let him have full control. Don't go with your way. Go with his way. Go with his word, his written word that tells us how to live. And you'll see a change. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is unto you and unto your children and unto those that are far off. As many as the Lord our God shall call. God bless you.